Okay, okay, my topics. Edaniku Enkki. Hello, my name is Grant Manyheads. And what I just said in Blackfoot was my name means singer. So that's actually my real name. And Grant Manyheads is my given government name. So today we have an interesting program for those of you who are tuning in. And we're going to be talking about the middlemen. The middlemen in trade particularly. So we're going to actually maybe go back in a synopsis on some of the programs we've had previously and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, briefly what who the Blackfoot speaking peoples are and what we can what we considered our homeland and from there we'll kind of move on into history and particularly the Cree Assiniboine middlemen trade uh, between the Siksikaitsi Tepiks, the Blackfoot speaking peoples and the French and the British in the form of the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company and how their trade goods got to us long before we ever met these European settlers. So actually let's take a, let's start with the program and I just wanted to show you those uh, who we're talking about as I mentioned and we're talking about the Siksikaitsi Tepiks and that previous symbol is actually the symbol for the Blackfoot Confederacy and as far as the Blackfoot Confederacy it's the Blackfoot speaking peoples. Now here we have four banners or flags that represent First Nations and these four First Nations represent the Siksikaitsi Tepiks today are the Blackfoot speaking peoples. Now where I am at here at Blackfoot Crossing Historical Park we're situated on Siksika or the Siksika Nation and you can see our emblem right there the second one off to the left. While we're just one fourth of the Blackfoot speaking peoples and you can see the other banners there. Now just to the side there of the Siksika Nation flag is the Atena or the blood tribe as they're known or in our language they would roughly translate to the many leaders or the many chiefs uh, tribe. Now just on the other side there we have the Pikani and now the Pikani are so huge that they actually had to break into two at one point in our history and we had the Northern Pikani or Northern Pagan as they're known and the Southern Pagan as they're known in the United States of America. But to the Blackfoot speaking peoples they are the uh, Apatusi Pikani or Skinny Pikani and the Amskapi Pikani. Amskapi meaning across and in this case across the border or the medicine line as we call it. So these are the four tribes that make up the Blackfoot speaking peoples. And I also want to point out that three of those tribes that you see, these are all in Canada, or, or what is known as Canada today, particularly Southern Alberta. And the other tribe, the Umskapi, are the, uh, known as the Blackfeet, which is uh, not accurate. But the, the blue flag there, that's the Umskapi Pikani, and they actually reside in what's known as the United States of America today. So these four nations make up the Blackfoot speaking peoples and that's who we're going to be talking about today, particularly our history. Now let's move on to the next image. Now here is a, a map or a picture of what we call Kitawas, our homeland. Now our homeland was not defined by the Blackfoot speaking peoples, but it was actually defined by Ini, or the bison. The, the Plains Buffalo, Plains Bison. Now wherever this animal roamed in the Northern Plains, the Siksikaiti Tepiks, or the Blackfoot speaking peoples, followed them. So it was actually Ini that defined our homeland. It wasn't the Blackfoot speaking peoples, it was Ini. Because as I mentioned, wherever this animal wandered or roamed, we followed them. Even as far back as uh, the dog days, ancient times, thousands of years, we did this cycle every year. Now I just kind of want to point out here we don't really have that but I kind of want to tell you what the extent of the Blackfoot lands were, our Kitawasana. Now from the Rocky Mountains you see in that picture, in, the, in our language we call them Mistapkists. Or I guess some people translate that to the backbone of the earth, like the spine. Well from there all the way out to almost the Manitoba Escarpment, to places like the Kapal Valley, Touchwood Hills, Nut Mountain. In this region is as far south or actually east as the Blackfoot lands went because this was all buffalo lands. And then as far north it was the North Saskatchewan River which goes by Rocky Mountain House, present-day Edmonton, all the way out to Prince Albert. 
So from there, all the way south to the Yellowstone River in uh, the present day uh, state of Montana, United States of America. Now all those lands in between are what the Blackfoot considered our homeland. Now I like to point this out because historically when the middlemen came, they got to know these lands. They got to know our lands right up to the mountains. But in those days, we were still friends. It was a friendly thing because the items that these traders were bringing to the Blackfoot speaking peoples were brand new. We had never seen these before. So long before we ever met any of the Europeans, the settlers, uh, the white man, quote unquote, and I use that term loosely, before we met any of these people, we were receiving their trade goods. And we were receiving those trade goods through the middlemen. And those are the Cree and Assiniboine tribes who are receiving them and they're bringing them over to us. So let's actually uh, move on to the next image. So let's kind of go back to our people. Well, in this language, in this word here, we kind of say, ito tasi mapiks imiteks, or it would roughly translate to in the days when we use dogs to move our things, move our camp. So it basically, basically translates to the dog days. Well, in the dog days, our people, the Blackfoot speaking people, are the six the beaks. We were at first the people moving from place to place using only dogs as our beast of burden. And so we followed these buffalo herds all over those vast lands, at first on foot. And that is why the Blackfoot speak speaking peoples got to know our land so intimately. We pretty well knew every good source of water, every bad source of water. Um, places where you could find your medicines, plants, foraging for certain things. Our people knew our land that well because we walked through it, like I mentioned. And then uh, eventually in time, and we look at the next image, then the horse came. And so that changed, that funda uh, fund as I have it right there, a fundamental change in this millennia old routine. So what was that millennia old routine? Well, that was the dog days. Since the beginning of the Blackfoot speaking people's existence, right up until the time that Punogomita, or the elk dog, or the horse, came into our lives, we were living the dog days. So for thousands of years, we were living this way. And it wasn't until circa 1700 that our lives changed. Now, a lot of people think we got the horse in maybe the 1720, 1725. But even the Blackfoot stories, our own oral history, tell stories a little bit different than those told by the, the traders. So we'll kind of look at this history from both points of view. Well, the Sixiga first obtained horses around 1700. And like I said, this is when was the end of the dog days. And I want to talk a little bit about the horse before we move on. Well, this animal, big changes, huge changes to the Blackfoot speaking peoples. We didn't even know what to call it. All we knew was as big as an elk, and in our language we say punoga, and it was as helpful as a dog, and in our language we say imita. So we put these two words together, ponokomita, and hence that's how the Blackfoot know this animal. We don't usually use the word horse. I mean, we know what that means, but to most Blackfoot speaking peoples, we still call this animal ponokomita. So let's actually move on to the next image. So yeah, here we have another one of the Punigomita, and like I kind of mentioned earlier, we have the historical um, proof, I suppose, of when the horse came to the Blackfoot-speaking peoples. But our oral history, which I would tend to rely a little bit more on, um, says that we got the horse a little bit earlier than the, what the Europeans think. So some of the, um, some of the stories that the Blackfoot have is that this animal came to us out of the water, the same as... Uh, Imita, or the dog did, and it was given to us as a gift by the Sita Peaks, by the water peoples. And this is what the Blackfoot believed. So we look at this animal as a sacred creature, and to this day, he still is a sacred creature. And um, he did wonders for the Blackfoot people, as if we go on to the next image, we'll see some of that. So once we got the horse, our Punokomita, let's move to the next image. Well, the six gates eat the beaks, as we could see in this image here, they could travel greater distances in larger groups. We move on to the next image. And also, once we got Punokomita, we could carry more possessions. 
as we move from place to place. Now, now if you really think about it, in the dog days, we couldn't carry too much. We only had our own strength and the strength of our pack animals, dogs, to move things from one place to the other. So you couldn't really accumulate spoils of war or any of that because what's most important was following the buffalo herds. You need to eat, you need food, you need clothing. And so I think warfare in the dog days wasn't a really big uh, issue unless it came to, to territory. So in those days, things were a lot more peaceful. So let's, uh, let's actually look at this next image here and we see that uh, once we got the horse, well, of course it is a whole lot easier to hunt the buffalo because you're running right up to it. In fact, the Blackfoot had buffalo runners. These were special horses and these horses were fast and they were brave. They could actually run right with the buffalo herds as the, um, the owners or the masters were shooting their weapons to take these buffalo down. And so these were prized animals if you could train them uh, to run like that. So hunting became a lot easier to our people once the horse came, but it also had kind of a negative effect. Let's look at the next image. So when the horse came, it also gave an entirely new meaning to our, or the Blackfoot speaking people's idea of warfare. Now, before the horse came, we were all on foot and usually sometimes they formed long lines and they had shields that they would stand behind and they would loose their arrows. And in those confrontations, maybe people were wounded, very rarely killed, but uh, usually the side that would win a battle would be the side that has had the most people. Well, once the horse came, that changed things on incredible scale because now you could run down your enemies, you could travel farther distances. And then our people, particularly the Siksigeti Tabiks, we developed new weapons, weapons uh, war clubs that we could use riding off of a horse to uh, inflict damage on our enemy, shock weapons, all sorts of things. So the horse, it kind of changed things for the Plains tribes on an incredible scale as well when it came to warfare. So let's look at the next image. So yeah, as we're talking a little bit about Bonokomita, uh, braiding parties, particularly amongst the Blackfoot, they became more common because the horse became the new measure of wealth to the Blackfoot speaking peoples. This was our way of determining if a person was successful or wealthy and could use these horses to barter or to trade. So the more horses you owned, the richer you were. If you had 10 horses, you did pretty well. If you had like 50, you were filthy rich. And if you had more than that, then you're like a billionaire. You're like uh, that former president they had in the States. You're that rich. <laughs> but the Bonagomita, as we see there, a lot more people died from this because those people who were trying to steal horses, if they got caught by other tribes, well, there usually wasn't prisoner exchange. You're, you were dead. They would kill you. They would uh, kill you for daring to steal their horse herds. Uh, the Blackfoot did that to other tribes, and other tribes did that to the Blackfoot raiders as well. So warfare increased because, because of this raiding and the bad blood it created, people dying because of uh, uh, raiders and such, this is when the warfare really kind of started to take off, among, especially amongst the Plains tribes, especially those tribes that wanted this particular animal, Punukomita, the horse. So let's move on to the next image. So here we can also see, like there was, uh, as I put it there, the, the Ponokomita, the conflicts had been based on territory. Yes, kind of like I mentioned earlier. Earlier, in the dog days, the only time you'd be conflicted is if it was over a buffalo herd or over our territory. If there was too many people crossing a certain river and they're going to start affecting your hunting grounds, well then, then this became a problem. Sometimes there's a lot of conflicts because of this. So actually, let's move on to the next image because we did kind of talk about Bunokomita. So let's talk about the middlemen in trade. So now I kind of want to point out that part of the horse because all of this is happening at the same time, you have to understand. To our, our ancestors, our grandmothers and grandfathers, in those days, and we're talking about the time when the Hudson Bay Company set up shop on the Hudson's Bay at York Factory, about 1670. Well, around this time, this was the first true transition for our people. Um, from one culture to another because now all of a sudden from the dog days now we're going into horse culture now we're learning to use the horse 
And not just that, now that we got the horse, as we look at this first image, Okay, actually, before we get into that, let's talk about Rupert's land. Let's kind of set this up so we can understand that. Now, in 1670, King Charles II of England, he granted a royal charter to create the Hudson's Bay Company. Now, this Hudson's Bay Company, it was under the governorship of the king's relation, his cousin, Prince Rupert of the Rhine. So according to the charter, the Hudson Bay Company received uh, rights to all of those, basically everything that drained into the Hudson's Bay, every river coming from the mountains all the way there, all of these lands they laid claim to. Now, all of this was unbeknownst to the Siksikaiti Tabiks. We had no idea that there's a quote unquote white king thousands and thousands of miles away making these decisions regarding these lands that we were living on for practically millennia and millennia and you know having the audacity to make these sort of rules and this is what they basically did so this Rupert's land if we actually move on to the next uh, image this is an image of the Rupert's land all of those lakes I mean not lakes those rivers and creeks that drain into the Hudson's Bay so everything you see in that colored area is what they considered Rupert's land and oddly enough Part of that, especially on the far western end, was Blackfoot territory, Kitawasinun, our land. And we, we even had more land extending into what they call the United States of America today, but south of the Milk River. And those rivers actually drain into the Gulf of Mexico. So that's just part of our, our lands, half of them. Those lands are drained to the Hudson's Bay. But yet, the English king made this decision. And so, hence the reason why they wanted to send more explorers into Prince Rupert's land to see if they could secure more uh, beaver pelts and water fur-bearing mammals for their uh, fur trade or the fashion industry that was going on in Europe at that time. So let's move on to the next image. So here we have the Cree Assiniboine middlemen trade. And this actually happened between 1680 to 1786. So practically for about a hundred years, this was uh, how the Blackfoot received trade goods. We received these trade goods over that hundred year period from these Cree and Assiniboine uh, tradesmen. And what they were doing, if we look at the next image, is they were getting these trade goods such as this. Uh, here we go, yeah, here we, let's, let's look at some of these trade goods that the Blackfoot were receiving. So we were getting pots and pans and these items made life a lot easier for our people because a boiling pit, for example, would literally take you half a morning from about six o'clock in the morning until noon. So six hours just to get the rocks hot enough to be able to make a boiling pit to be able to boil food or render glue or to uh, extract the marrow from broken bones. But now with the trade goods, you could see pots and pans and kettles. And these are what our people would get from the middlemen. And now you could just fill it with water or whatever you're going to boil it for. And then it takes like eight minutes over an open fire. That's just one example. So these trade goods made our life a lot easier. Now at first we weren't necessarily receiving firearms from the Cree and the middlemen because they didn't want us to be as uh, powerful as they were with their, uh, with their edge, with their... Uh, muskets and firearms. But what they did sell us were things like hatchets and axes and tobacco and trade beads and pieces of metal and things like this that our people could use. But more often than not, they charged exorbitant prices. If we look at the next image. Now, as I mentioned, yeah, the European goods, they first came to the Blackfoot speaking peoples through the Cree and the Assiniboine middlemen. Now these people, the Cree and the Assiniboine, where the Hudson Bay set up shop, this was their homeland. Now the Cree were actually north, closer to the York factory, uh, and north of York factory. And then the Assiniboine were actually a little bit between there and the Mississippi, the Missouri, the, the lowlands of the Great Lakes, south of there. But in these areas here, the Cree and Assiniboine actually became allies. And the Assiniboine, who are part of the Dakota people, they actually broke away from their uh, previous uh, tribal affiliations, Lakota and the uh, Dakota. And so these Nakota kind of broke away from them, the Assiniboine, 
And then they, allied to the Cree, kind of uh, preceded the Hudson Bay Company and Northwest Company traders on the North Saskatchewan going westward. So this all happened between 1680 and 1786. So when these tribes came onto Blackfoot lands at that time, it was in the spirit of friendship. Now the Blackfoot people had never seen these trade goods before and now we had these neighbors of ours who we never had conflicts before, truly, coming this way with these trade goods. And more often than not, we would give them more for these trade goods. And this is how it was for literally a hundred years, this process, this cycle. These people would get more furs from the Blackfoot and then they would go back to the Hudson Bay, bring these furs down there and then acquire brand new things. And then after a few years, they would take those same goods and sell them to the Blackfoot as used goods, but the Blackfoot didn't know it at that time. So let's actually go on to the next image. So here we have the Hudson Bay Company, yeah, an image of the Hudson Bay Company setting up there in the Hudson Bay on the York factory, they called it, which was their first trading post, truly. And so these Assiniboine and Cree middlemen in trade were actually getting these items from the traders at this post, York Factory, and then they would bring them inland to the prairie tribes. So let's look at the next image. And then here you can see them doing their trading inland there, the background there, you can see the ships. And so these uh, Cree and Assiniboine middlemen, more often than not, got these trade goods from the Hudson Bay Company, but they also got them from the Northwest Company, and they were French. And so we'll kind of see that. Let's actually move on to the next image. Oh, and I want to point out, oh, this is an image of a, of a native in a canoe. And I just want to point out, to the Blackfoot-speaking peoples, we did not use canoes. We did not use the rivers as waterways or as, uh, as highways. In fact, we wandered on foot at first all over our lands, walking over prairie, and first on foot and then on horseback. But these native peoples, especially those natives who were living below the Manitoba Escarpment and what they call the Canadian Shield today, well, a lot of these, na these native tribes, they had to have canoes to move around from place to place. They would go as far as they can in the direction they're going in a canoe, which was fast, faster than walking, and then they would portage. They'd walk from one place to another and then drop their canoe back in that area and then continue going on. And this is how these traders and these um, native tribes actually made their way into Blackfoot country. When they came up the Manitoba Escarpment, they portaged with their canoes and continued on their way to places such as Fort Augustus, Fort Pitt, Fort Edmonton, and uh, Rocky Mountain House until eventually they reached the Rocky Mountains. And as um, in the Blackfoot tradition, this is the first time that these native tribes had ever made their way this far west because to the Blackfoot speaking peoples, this is a part of Kitawas, our homeland. So they were newcomers at this time. And this would have been between 1680 and, and 1786. So let's move on to the next part of the program here. Here we have the middlemen in trade. So the trading of European goods were mostly for furs and for horses. And you know, that's kind of, um, you know, here's a trade-off. Even at this time, the Blackfoot only traded so many horses to these newcomers. Just as the newcomers only sold so many firearms to the Blackfoot. And I think the reason was is neither side wanted to upset that balance of power because it did kind of keep it um, balanced. Because the Blackfoot people had horses, we had that advantage over these people who were coming in on foot, even on canoes. And then these people coming in were able to come in with their firearms, but they also knew they had to get back. And they traveled far distances. So this kind of balanced things out, uh, the horses for uh, guns sort of a trade. But even then, it wasn't really a big, big something that happened. It didn't happen a lot. And the reason why we know this is because if you look at the trade records from the Hudson Bay Company going back to 1680 up until about 1707, there was only a once where they got a, sold a lot of firearms and then in the years after they didn't have that many firearm sales and that's because the Cree didn't want to sell the inland tribes all of this extra firepower which would actually put us on an equal footing and then maybe it wouldn't be so good and that's probably true and we'll learn that as we go through this uh, the slides here now I want to point that out because at first when the Cree and Assiniboine and the Blackfoot tribes met, there was peace. 
It was friendly encounters. And this was because both sides, both sides, sorry, um, recognized and followed our ancient protocols. So, so long as we follow protocols, there wasn't any reason for bloodshed. So let's go on to the next image. So, like I mentioned earlier, more often than not, the uh, Siksigates eat the beaks. You usually paid three times more for goods that were secondhand, secondhand goods from the middlemen. But, I mean, actually that's wise when you think about it. A lot of these things were made out of metal, so you could use them and over again. And plus, the, the middlemen also knew that they could buy brand new objects from the Hudson Bay Company traders. So they would sell their used items for three times the amount. They would carry the tribes down, I mean, carry the furs downstream to York Factory. And they had this cycle going on and on. And basically, this is the same cycle that the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company traders used when they made their way up west, was following this already established trade route that the Cree and the Assiniboine had already uh, basically laid out for them before they came up this way because we were trading with them first. So let's move on to the next image. So the fur trade, let's talk a little bit about the fur trade. So as I mentioned, the Cree and the Assiniboine with their bounty of furs that they got from the Blackfoot speaking peoples, they went back to York Factory and they traded with the Hudson Bay Company traders for more goods and repeated the process. So for a hundred years or so, as I mentioned, this was the process from the time. In, and this was before the Blackfoot had seen any of the Europeans face to face. We were already, already receiving their trade goods. Now let's move on to the next image. So let's talk a little bit about the intertribal trade. So the trading of uh, European goods for furs and horses, this opened the door to friendly trade relations between the Blackwood speaking peoples and the Cree and the Assiniboine. And this is evident by a story of Sakomapi. Now in the Blackwood language, Sakomapi, it's written there, means boy. Now this was the name of a, a Cree, an old Cree man who was living with the Blackfoot, apparently had married into the tribe and perhaps his wife had died, but he was already an old man living with the Blackfoot, particularly the Pikani, when David Thompson met, met him. So in his story, he talks a lot about the things that were going on when he first came to live amongst the Pikani. And this would have been around the same time that we got the horse. So this is kind of a, a really uh, interesting story to listen to because it talks about events in the history of the Blackfoot speaking peoples. And particularly as seen by an old, um, a newcomer, a Cree, who was living amongst the Blackfoot. So let's actually move on to the next image. Now, Hudson Bay Company trader, David Thompson, he's the one that recorded that story. But actually, let's look at the trade route as has to how goods came into Blackfoot country. Now when I say Blackfoot country, I'm gonna be talking about all of those uh, where you see the North Saskatchewan River to like the South Saskatchewan River and that particular area here. Now this, these were the Hudson Bay Company posts when they, excuse me, sorry, let me correct myself. These were actually the Northwest Company posts. So these were coming from Montreal and these were French traders. And these French traders were already in competition with the Hudson Bay Company when they set up. And they both wanted to get as many beaver pelts and fur-bearing mammals, small fur-bearing mammals, particularly water mammals, wanted their pelts for the fur trade, for the fashion industry in Europe. So they're both competing with each other for this. And they both came into Blackfoot territory around the same time. Now, if you look at this particular map, uh, sorry, let's go back to that last map. Now this particular map is how the French came into Blackfoot country. You can see them going through the Great Lakes there and then you can kind of see them going up to Lake Winnipeg and then making their way on the North Saskatchewan into Blackfoot country and then making their way north up into like Fort uh, Providence and Fort Chippewa. And then you can see them making their way to the coast in time. This is under David Thompson and such uh, uh, traders such as that. But this is how they came into Rupert's land, into Blackwood country around uh, 1670 to, to 17, uh, 1780. This is how 
the French came into Blackfoot country. Now, before the French actually made it this far into Blackfoot country, we have to take a look at the Hudson Bay Company. So let's take a look at the next image. And here you can see the Hudson Bay Company. Now, from the Hudson's Bay, you can see that blue line, and that's the route that they took to get into Blackfoot country all the way to the Rocky Mountains. And then at one point, they had to go north and go to the Peace River and go across the Rocky Mountains from there to make their way all the way down to Fort Vancouver, as you can see there. That's the Columbia River. Now, this is all happening, this, these rival tradesmen. And this is happening during the time of the middlemen in trade, uh, the Cree and the Assiniboine, bringing their trade goods out to the Blackfoot. So this is how we see them coming onto our lands. And so that's actually, uh, you know, that's an interesting point because the Cree and the Assiniboine tribes, as far as the Blackfoot Confederacy are concerned, they were never in our country thousands of years ago. These are people new to the plains. And the thing is, when these people came out this way, then they had to adapt, especially after 1821 when the Northwest Company and the Hudson Bay Company merged together. These native tribes basically got fired by them and they had to survive on their own. Hence uh, this competition with the Blackfoot tribes and then this rivalry and then hence um, the bloodshed that occurred over the years. But this is how they first came into our country. They actually preceded the Northwest Company and Hudson Bay Company traders into Blackfoot territory. Let's move into the next uh, image here. Now, let's go back to Sakumapi. So Thompson, he recorded this uh, account of important Siksika history. And it was during the lifetime of this man, well, actually, this is just an image, but it was during the lifetime of this Cree Indian, by the, our Cree native, by the name of Sakumapi. And in this spelling that you see here, this is actually kind of like, Sub, somewhat quoted from the book, I wanted to use a spelling that people were familiar with when it came to Sakhkomapi as written in the book, so we use it here as well in that spelling. Although a lot of um, people well, would probably not want to spell it that particular way because it's not, uh, it's not accurate. But we're going to leave it like that for the purpose of this story. Now, as I mentioned, Sakhkomapi, it's a Blackfoot word meaning boy. Now, he may have been this man may have been with the first group of Cree and Assiniboine that came to the Blackfoot people. Now obviously when he came they were in peace. And so these native uh, tribes, the Cree that Sakumapi was with, was with, were actually trading goods already with the Blackfoot. And this would have been in the time period as we'll see probably about 1707. Let's actually move on. So Sakumapi, he'd been living with the Pikani for many, many years before David Thompson of the Hudson's Bay Company. He was a trader before he, uh, the winter of 1787, 88, because that's the year that David Thompson uh, spent with the Blackfoot. And during that time, he lived in Sakumapi's lodge. So, and here's the other interesting thing is, at that time, David Thompson's guides into Blackfoot country would have been Cree and they would have been Assiniboine. So he even said in his later um, publishings that he spoke a smattering of Cree. So it wasn't a language that was unknown to him. So when he came to stay with the Blackfoot and he had Sakhkomapi, an aged Cree man, as his uh, host, well, they both spoke the same language. So there would have been a lot of information that David Thompson would have been able to glean from this man um, because they spoke the, the same language as opposed to him trying to figure out what somebody, somebody was saying if they spoke two completely different languages and had no, nothing to guide them with. So anyway, David Thompson spent the winter and he learned off this man a lot of the Blackfoot history in that, in that period of time. So let's move on to the next image. Now at that time Thompson, he estimated that Sakhkomapi's age at that time must have been at least 75 to 80. Now this is based on David Thompson's estimate. I mean that could be literally give or take a hundred years. In fact in the, the story that Sakhkomapi relates, he doesn't tell David Thompson how old he is. So he could have been 90 years old as far as we know, maybe 100, but he was an elderly, elderly man. And so um, according to Thompson's estimate, this man could have been uh, born as early as 1697 and maybe no later than 1712. So that's around that 1700 circa. 
1700 mark. And if we actually look at the next image, well, in dating his first episode of his story, Sakomapi pointed to a boy, a lad of about 16 years in the camp, and he said that he had been about that boy's age when he went with a small group of Cree to aid the Pikani, or the Pagan as it's written there, in a battle with the snakes, or the Shoshone. So he, he was a part of this first group, and, it, and as it said in the as it said in the article there, they were friends already. So they came to befriend, to help out their friends. So we figured this may have happened around 1713, no later than 1728, given this time period. So if this actually happened around 1713, well then at that time, we had neither guns nor horses. So in that battle, that's actually kind of the reason why that was written, was pointed out, is that in this battle between the Cree, the Pikani, on one side against the Shoshone on the other, neither side used guns or horses. So this had to have been around 1713 at the earliest, 1728 at the latest. So let's move on to the next image. Now in Sakomapi's story, it says he says that he returned to his own people, he grew to be a man, he became a skill, skillful and fortunate hunter, and then he got a wife. And his wife, we believe, came from the Pikani people. And so before his marriage, the Shoshone, or the snakes, once again, they had made use of their new secret weapon. And these were horses. And they used these horses in battle with the Pikani. And the Pikani told, um, well, the story that Thompson was told was that as the Pikani were running across the of the field or across the grass trying to get away from these mounted riders, these mounted riders would use, and the word there is I'm not too even sure if that's the uh, word or a corruption of a word, and that they would use these and, and hit them on the heads. And if we look at the next image, this is what a Shoshone war club looked like. So that's pretty devastating if they were chasing you down with one of these things and bonking you on the head, basically uh, either killing you or are, are hurting you very, very badly. This is what the Shoshone were doing at that time. So during Sakomapi's lifetime, he first came and he helped the Bikani in a battle against the Shoshone. And so this kind of tells you a lot about that time period now. Now in the Blackwood oral tradition, we were warring against the Crow and the Shoshone because they came onto lands that we had vacated because of the smallpox. Now, that doesn't mean we gave up on them, but when we started to go back into these lands that we vacated because of the smallpox, then we found these other tribes there, particularly the Shosh uh, Shoshone and the Crow. And so this is that time period. So when the Cree and the Assiniboine came out into Blackfoot country, they actually were at war with the Shoshone as well. So that's why we were allied together. And together, in this first battle, we managed to push the Shoshone back in Sakomapi's lifetime, a few years later, as he's about to get married to his new wife, he joins the Pikani again. And this time, the Shoshone have weapons. They have horses and they're uh, going after the Pikani. So they have the advantage at this time. So let's actually move on to the next image. So in Sakomapi's saga, after his marriage, he again went to the aid of the Pikani. So another battle was fought with the Shoshone, but this time the enemy used no horses, while the Bikani and their Cree and Assiniboine allies were armed with ten guns. Now this goes with the oral tradition with the Blackfoot-speaking peoples who say that we befriended the Cree and the Assiniboine when we fought against the Shoshone the first time, and that's when they first used their guns and gave us the advantage over our um, our enemies at that time. So this is when the Blackwood first became familiar with guns, with uh, fire sticks, <laughs> but with rifles, muskets and such that were being sold by the Hudson Bay Company. Now these were coming to us through the Cree and Assiniboine middlemen. And here we can see the kind of muskets that they were selling at that time. Some of them were pretty long, but the Blackwood would file down the bases because they were more, uh, if, if they were the longer barrel, they were good for uh, hunting. But if it was warfare or defense, then they usually filed it down the barrel somewhat so you can get more of a scatter. 
So this is what the Blackfoot got from the Hudson Bay Company and the French in that time. We're talking about 1790. These are the type of weapons they had at that time. So uh, the Blackfoot would get these sort of guns in trade with the Cree and Assiniboine, but they didn't always get all the ammunition and all of the bullets or, or um, rounds as such. And so when you didn't have those, that weapon was pretty much ineffective. And so the Cree and the Assiniboine middlemen in trade actually had control of that part of the trade. So let's move on to the next image. So in this battle, terrified by the noise and the deadly effect of this new secret weapon, those closely formed Shoshone battle lines, they broke and its members, they left in confusion. So it was shortly after this time that the Blackfoot basically forced the Cree, no, sorry, forced the Shoshone and the Crow back into, across the mountains, back to their, their homelands or the lands that they came from. And then the Blackfoot retook those lands that they had vacated at one point. And to do that, they got help from our Cree and Assiniboine allies. And also at that time, you have to understand now, after all of this in Sakhomapi's story, which is around the early part of the 17th century, 1700 to 1725, the Blackfoot became accustomed to two things in life that they never had before, and that's firearms and horses. And because of this lesson learned, over that period of time, the Blackfoot began to acquire both. And even though the middlemen were still decreeing the Assiniboines, they would still sell their muskets for horses because horses were so rare to those tribes east of the Blackfoot and even amongst the traders. So let's move on to the next image. So I'm not too sure what I put down here, but it says, okay, uh, yeah, so here, you know, it's probable that parts of the Blackfoot speaking peoples, we obtained our first horses from the Shoshone with whom we were at war. But there's also those oral traditions, not just from the Blackfoot speaking peoples, but also from our neighboring tribes who were enemies at some points and weren't, were friends at others, but like the Nez Perce, or the Pondere, or uh, the Salish Kootenai. Now, in our traditions, we weren't always at war with these people. In fact, we had a lot of peaceful trade. And so, these natives also had lots of horses long before they met with the Blackfoot. So it's possible around that 1700 mark that the Blackfoot were already getting horses from these natives. And the thing is, they may not have been the Pikani. In fact, the Pikani were a little bit farther north and closer to the mountains. It's possible that uh, sister tribes, such as the Siksika or the, the Agena, Argena, the blood tribe, that these native tribes that were living farther south or in the middle, they could have been receiving horses long before the Pikani and David Thompson's account. So that's why we go with that date circa 1700, because of these oral stories particularly the peaceful trade that we were supposed to have enjoyed at one time with those mountain tribes, that over time we began to raid for more and more horses. And yeah, by the late 18th century, theft, that was the primary uh, medium of horse getting, horse acquisition. So I want to point out here, oh yes, and David Thompson, he observed that the Blackfoot speaking peoples were raiding these same natives, the Shoshone, the Flathead, the Kootenai for horses in 1787. So around the same time that we, we met with the traders face to face, these were the tribes that we were already at war with. So the account of Sakhomapi going back the previous, the previous 80 years or 90 years, this kind of just tells you as to what happened. But when David Thompson actually was living amongst the Blackfoot, he was telling the reader how things actually were. And at that time, the Blackfoot had already cleared out a lot of these other tribes and had retaken back our homeland. So, and we were already mounted and armed. So let's move on to the next uh, uh, image. So here's that trade system again. We have the Hudson Bay Company route going in there, just on the north side of the Blackfoot territory, Kitawas. So let's move on to the next image. Now, the first uh, known explorer to come into Blackfoot lands was Henry Kelsey. Now, he left York Factory in 1690. So this is about 10, 20 years after they set up the York Factory. And he spent two years at that time inland. And so when they went up the, the rivers and they made their way to Lake Winnipeg, eventually they kept going and they got to the Touchwood Hills. 
Now at this time, this land was the homeland of the Blackfoot-speaking peoples. Yes, it was still a part of our homeland, Kitawa Sanun, but it was the more immediate homeland of our allies. And those were the Groven, or who they call the Arapaho. Now these native tribes were living up in that Prince Albert region between the two Saskatchewans, the North Saskatchewan and the South Saskatchewan. And they were our allies. And they were also buffalo hunting uh, people. And so the thing is, they were living in that area. We were enjoying this peace and this um, camaraderie and intermarriage and such with this allied tribe. And then just to the east of them were the Cree and the Assiniboine who had moved in up the river by that time. So by 1690, he went as far as the Touchwood Hills. And so in the Touchwood Hills, this is as far west as he traveled with his Cree and Assiniboine guides. And then when he got there, he was basically told by his Cree and Assiniboine guides that west of there were the, what they call the Archithinu tribes, our strangers, or people that they didn't know. So obviously, um, these people in the Blackfoot, we did not really know one another then. It wasn't until the trade came that we started to get to know one another. But before then, there were none of these native tribes in the Blackfoot territory. And so when Henry Kelsey visited in 1690-91, he also pointed out that at that time, he did not see any horses, any horses at all amongst any of the tribes which he visited. And so Henry Kelsey actually made it as far as the Touchwood Hills. He would have uh, met with the Groven before he would have met with any of the Blackfoot speaking tribes. And at that time, there were no horses on his visit. So that's 10 years before the 17th century started. So let's move on the, uh, to the next uh, image. And so here, now here we have another picture of Kitawa Sanun. And I, I say kind of take this in because this is uh, an important part of our, of learning about this particular history. Now, on the North Saskatchewan there, you could see all the different posts that they eventually set it up. And at the bottom there, the Yellowstone. So we didn't have to trade with the Americans for another 200 years almost, from the 1680 or so, a little bit past 200 years. And so the tr people that we were trading with at first, for that first 100 years, were the middlemen between us and the Hudson Bay. And then over time, they made their way inland. But actually, let's move on to the next image. So here we have a picture of Henry Kelsey. Now, like I mentioned here, this is actually him on a stamp, what they figure he must have looked like, or maybe it's based on a drawing, I'm not sure. But like I mentioned, he was uh, just a young guy. He was actually not even 20 years old when he made his way out west. And he was working for the, for the Hudson Bay Company. He made his way as far as the Touchwood Hills, as I mentioned, and he did not record any horses when he visited. So let's move on to the next image. Now a few years later, Anthony Henday, or Hendry, he kind of goes by both, Henday or Hendry, I don't know what his original name would have been, but it's written Hendry or Henday, so we'll go with that. So when Anthony Hendry undertook his expedition, he came to Eastern Alberta uh, in 1754. So this is about 60 to 70 years after they set up uh, York Factory on the Hudson's Bay Company. And he went as far east as Buffer Lake. And that's as far as he went before he even came across his first horse. Up until that time, he never came across any horses. So in 1754, that kind of tells you that those tribes that were east of the Blackfoot, it was rare for them to even have a horse. So, the, but at that time, the Blackfoot already had uh, Lots and lots of horses. So it was among the Groven and the Siksikaitsita beaks that were living beyond that lake to the west that he found his first horses. He also records that he did not meet any Assiniboine bands at that time using horses until he reached the area of Sounding Creek, Alberta. And then he gives that longitude of about 110 to 111 degrees west. And the band that he met there was a small one a uh, small band of Assiniboine, only seven lodges, and he bought his first horse from them. And at that time, there were other mountain Assiniboine groups that were seen in the same vicinity, but more often than not, as he pointed out, they were traveling with Archithinu natives. So that could have been Groven, that could have been uh, Tsutena, that could have been Blackfoot uh, uh, tribes, any of those tribes. But those tribes were always traveling with those 
uh, Assiniboine bands, Mountain Assiniboine as they're known now. So that kind of tells you that even in those days, this wasn't their homeland. They eventually made their way to the mountains and then they made their homeland. But in prehistory times, they had no presence here. They actually came in with, uh, preceded the, the fur traders. So let's move on to the next image. Here we can see Henry Kelsey's route, and that's the one in purple at the bottom there. And he, he made it as far as the Touchwood Hills before he turned back to York Factory. And then a few years later, then you can see there's Anthony Hendry. He actually made it as far as Red Deer. We'd say probably the Red Deer River, the Red Deer area. And this is where he met the Blackfoot speaking peoples before he made his way back. So you can see along that route, there are very, very, there are very rare, <laughs> there were very rarely any horses when he came out. And then a, a few years later, only the Blackfoot and the Groban had uh, a huge amount of horses and this was all between uh, before they actually set up their first trading post in Blackfoot country so during this time there's horses being traded for guns and such and so there's all of this middlemen and trade going on before any of the traders actually met with the Blackfoot face to face so let's look at the next image now in the fall of 1754 Anthony Hendry when he went out with with uh, this Korean Assiniboine guides to seek uh, trade with uh, Blackfoot or the other natives that were living west of uh, with them. As I mentioned, the Cree called those tribes Archithinu. So that means that, uh, I'm not even really sure what it means, something like the strangers or so are the enemies. But even at this time, 1754, we, know, we knew of each other as tribes. The Blackfoot knew of the Cree and the Assiniboine, and the Cree and the Assiniboine knew of the Blackfoot, but we still weren't sure of one another because we were trading goods, but then things may have happened where uh, violent, uh, violence started to occur. And then over time, these trading became uh, deadly. Actually, some there's are already a lot of conflicts between the Blackfoot and the Assiniboine bands that first came into um, the Blackfoot country. Uh, and we know this from these records uh, from the Hudson Bay Company and from the at Northwest Company, a lot of these traders left records behind as to uh, the politics, as to what was happening, even with the native tribes. So actually, let's move on to the next image. Now, when Matthew Cocking was sent by the Hudson's Bay Company in 1772, he tried to open trade with the Archithinu. So even by that time, 1772, we were still known to these people as Archithinu. So they didn't know us. We weren't friends to the point that we were really good buddies but we were friendly with each other that we were able to trade but even over that course of a hundred years it wasn't all friendly because a lot of conflicts started to occur especially during this middleman trade now he want oh also uh, when Matthew Cocking he was the first trade first fur trader to state that uh, Sixigatsi to be Basically, the Blackfoot-speaking tribes, meaning the Siksika, the Gaina, the Bikani, as well as our Tsutina allies, who we called Sarsi, and the Groban, who are also known as Arapaho, well, these five tribes were all equestrian uh, natives, as far as he knew. So that's the earliest definite statement to that fact that the Blackfoot already had horses. And this is as early as 1772, 1754. So let's look at the next image. We'll take a look at, uh, so here we have, uh, well, as the Cree and the Assiniboine, when they came westward, it was sort of an aggressive push because of this middleman and trade. They were making a lot of profits from this middleman trade, and not just amongst the Blackfoot and the, and the Prairie tribes, but also north of us, amongst the Chippewa, amongst the Dene and a lot of these. But then, like, with the Blackfoot, a lot of conflicts occurred. And I think this was because a lot of the other, these other tribes looked as the looked at the Cree and Assiniboine advancement as aggressive. So when they came into our lands, they were um, because of the trade initial initially they got to know other tribes' lands, where they camped, where they lived, where they frequented, and when everybody was friendly, that was no problem. But when people became enemies, well, then this became a problem because now. Uh, these enemy tribes knew where you were camping. 
And so this happened with this uh, middleman trade. A lot of conflict with a lot of tribes took place because uh, more often than not, a lot of those uh, preceding tribes didn't really honor the agreements made with the natives uh, that their brethren may may not have, uh, how would you say, may not have made those same agreements. So anyways, let's move, actually move on to the next image. Now in the summer of 17, 1717, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this was Matthew Cocking, he revised his estimate. Actually, no, this was Henry Kelsey. He, he, um, he was at the Hudson Bay Company and in the York factory, and the previous summer in 1716, he found out that a lot of Assiniboine middlemen in trade and Cree had died. And he's wondering what was happening. And then the next year he found out and he revised his estimate of their losses. And particularly in this case, it was the Assiniboine, the ones who preceded them going up North Saskatchewan. And he had said that they had numbered 200 tents. And then he went on to say that there was only five or six of these tents that were left. And he considered this to be a great loss to the Hudson Bay Company because, as he said, these natives were amongst the best beaver Indians as comes to trade with us, quote unquote. So even as early as 1770, the Cinnaboyne and the Cree would have been trading with the Blackfoot for only, at tops, 47 years, less than 50 years. But even by that time, those Cree and Assiniboine who came onto Blackfoot lands and maybe uh, made the mistake of hunting the buffalo without permission or, or protocols that this group of Assiniboine who numbered 200 tents now only numbered six and so are five or six and so that kind of tells you a lot that's a lot of bloodshed that's happening even as early as 1717 and that tells you that the six gates eat the beaks even then were still jealous over our lands and in fact in a lot of accounts uh, a lot of the natives didn't mind going to Blackfoot country and enjoying the hospitality so long as they didn't hunt or trap on Blackfoot lands. And when some of the Hudson Bay Company traders or explorers asked those natives, well, why won't you trap here? Or why won't you do this? And those natives would tell them because the Blackfoot would kill us if they caught us doing that. So obviously there were protocols that existed that were in place at that time. But over time they started to be broken. And this is what caused a lot of these conflicts and bloodshed. So let's actually move on to the next image. So as the, he pointed out, most of the losses the Cree and the Assiniboine suffered, they were inflicted by what they called the Muscote, Muscote Indians. And these were quote unquote Indians that lived between the Buffalo, Pain, Buffalo Plains, between the north and south branches of the Saskatchewan River. So that's basically uh, where Edmonton, North Saskatchewan River is, and the South Saskatchewan is, is what the Bow and the uh, Belly River and the Waterton River and the uh, Old Man River all eventually empty and meet up near Prince Albert. Well, that's the South Saskatchewan. So all the natives that lived there, as far as even in the Blackfoot oral tradition, those would have been our people. Those would have been our allies and they would have been our people, particularly uh, the Gaina and the Siksika. We would have been living up in that area there with our allies, the Groven. And so a lot of the other tribes even that were living farther to the west, like the Sarsia, Tutena, and the Dene, these are tribes that are actually also at war with the Cree and Assiniboine at that time. So the Cree and Assiniboine were suffering a lot of losses, even as early as 1717, as far as the records show. So this middleman trade wasn't always peaceful. And in fact, uh, the war between the Cree and Assiniboine and the Blackfoot warfare increased dramatically after 1821. But even a hundred years before then, there were still conflicts, still conflicts that were going on between our people, even with the middleman trade. So let's actually move on to the next uh, image. Uh, once again, here's Kitawasanun, what we considered our ancient homeland. And so you can kind of see up there where Prince Albert is, where the two North Saskatchewan and South Saskatchewan meet. While between those two top rivers up there, that's what the Cree and Assiniboine called Buscote. And so it was those natives living there that actually inflicted all of the serious injuries to their people when they came out in the middlemen trade. So that was as early as 1717, according to Hudson Bay Company uh, records. So let's move on to the next image. 
Now there's actually a, a Siksika chief, uh, Old Swan, but he was also known as the Feather. And as early as uh, 1717, he said that, and he even pushed for this, as his father, they had the same last name, I mean the same name I should say, Old Swan, he took his father's name, and that was actually almost a dynasty name, Old Swan. But this Old Swan, also known as the Feather, he was one of the ones who encouraged this friendly trade between the Blackfoot-speaking peoples and the traders, the newcomers coming in, and the Cree and the Assiniboine. Now, he wanted this, uh, he actually wanted us to have better relations with the Hudson Bay Company traders. So he encouraged that so that they would come for, farther inland so that we could trade with them and thus eliminate the middlemen in trade. Because even by that time, as early as 1707, and actually I might be wrong with that date, it could have been even earlier, but there were already Blackfoot natives traveling with Cree and Assiniboine natives in canoe all the way to York Factory and coming back. So we started to know what was going on in, as far as politics and trade, even at that time. So even at that time, some of the Blackfoot were really encouraging these uh, friendly relations between these uh, trading partners. So let's, uh, let's actually move on to the next image. So like I mentioned, in 1717, there was already records of conflicts between these native tribes in the middlemen who were all involved in the middlemen, in tr middlemen trade. But by 1786, and this is around the time when David Thompson came out, met Sahakumapi, and Peter Fiddler came a couple of years later and established these trading relationships with the Blackfoot-speaking peoples. And they all started doing this around the same time that they set up this place. That's Manchester House, Hudson Bay Company Post, and it was established in 1786. Now, this is the first time, this is when the first European traders dealt directly with the Siksikaitse Tupiks, the Blackfoot-speaking peoples, here at Manchester House which opened on the North Saskatchewan River in 1786, and that was just east of present-day Prince Albert. Now, that tells you how far the Blackfoot lads actually went. We weren't, um, when we say we were trading with these people at this place, this place was situated right at the edge of Blackfoot territory, so we know how far the Blackfoot lads went. As far as the buffalo roamed, and they, they, they followed they roamed as far as Manchester House and we followed them into that area there. So this is the first place that we dealt with the Europeans face to face. And for the first time we got as much uh, goods as we wanted from them without anybody kind of uh, stopping us from getting firearms or ammunition or uh, bullets or bullet molds, etc. All of these things, nothing was um, basically, uh, how would you say, boycotted to us. We can get anything we want at this place. And when that happened, that essentially ended the middlemen trade in 1786. So let's move on to the next image. Now here we have another picture of the Blackfoot homeland. So all of this was happening, uh, when you see up there by Prince Albert, it's just a little bit east of there that Manchester House opened. So that's when the Blackfoot tribes first started trading with the Europeans. It wasn't up near the mountains or Rocky Mountain House or even Edmonton or even near the Alberta Saskatchewan border. The Blackwood tribes first started trading with the Europeans just to the east of Prince Albert. So even in those days, 1786, this was all Blackfoot territory and if there were any tribes that came in, these were visiting tribes. and a lot of these tribes began to settle in those areas that the Groban lived in, which is between, uh, up in the Prince Albert region. And over time, they eventually drove those Groban out. Just after we started to trade with, uh, with um, the European traders face to face, our allies to the east were forced out of their homelands to the Milk River region. And then that's when the Cree and the Assiniboine tribes basically took over those lands and they settled a lot of their people and over time made their way up the Battle River and the North Saskatchewan River. And so actually that's a little bit of the story about the middlemen in trade. I think I'm not too sure where we're at. Can we look at the next image here? Yeah, okay, so I think we're at the end of our program. Once the traders reached our land, Kitawasan, and they established their posts, well, that's when our people got a regular supply of guns and ammo and alcohol. 
So it wasn't always good. And then thus, it was at that time that the middleman, uh, middleman trade ended. Now, as I mentioned, between 1670 and 1786, this time when they opened up Manchester House, there was friendly trade and it started off friendly. But over time, things kind of soured between different groups and there were conflicts that took place, as was evident by uh, David Thompson's account there of uh, the Muscate losses amongst the, um, the Cinnaboyne and the Cree. Now, this was happening, and but things didn't really go bad until the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company, the British and the French, when they merged, or when the Scots and the British, when they merged with the new Hudson Bay Company in 1821, that merger essentially ended the employment of the Cree and the Assiniboine and the Métis in supplying uh, uh, of moving furs for these companies. So when that happened, these tribes began to compete with the Siksikaitse Tupiks in feeding the company and providing furs and all of these things. And so after 1821, up until the signing of the treaties, this is when the warfare really got bad. But I just like to point out that even during the middlemen in trade, this is where things started to get a little bit more hostile. And a lot of that was, as I mentioned, because a lot of protocols were no longer being met and a lot of people were just doing what they wanted to do without asking permissions. So hence all the conflicts. But in the next episodes to come here, um, oh yeah, I just want to point this out here. Actually, let's go back to the next image. Did you know, and I just wanted to point this out, you know, from the beginning, trade was profitable and they used liquor for all of that trade. So most of the companies, the Hudson Bay Company, the Northwest Company, and the American Fur Companies, they all use this liquor with the trade. I like to point that out because a lot of um, all the trade that the Blackwood had with any of the companies regarding e uh, the Fur Company, American Company, the French fur, fur Trading Companies, all of these companies used alcohol. The only traders that didn't were the middlemen. They didn't use the alcohol in the trade. And that's kind of an interesting point. Amongst the native tribes, we weren't using alcohol. Uh, we trade everything else, but, so that's really a, a kind of a noteworthy note. So this is the end of our broadcast. Uh, next week, we're gonna be talking about the Hudson Bay Company trade and the Northwest Company trade and how that trade affected us. The middleman trade affected our people in a certain way. And then once the Europeans came into our lives, change happened big time once again. So we'll talk about that next week, the next episodes. If any of you have any questions at all regarding anything that was said today or anything that you saw, please send in um, a request or send in to programs at blackwoodcrossing.ca uh, any of your questions and we'll do our best to address them and get back to you uh, when, we, when we can at our e earliest possible convenience. So anyways, with that, I'd like to Wish you a good week, rest of the week. We'll see you next week. And uh, remember, take care of each other and take care of yourself. Edomatsen.